um, Professor Georgina Odaipo from the Department of Virology. So we start by revising a little of our understanding about viruses. Of course, you know that viruses are the smallest known infective agents. They're also known as filtrable agents because they can pass through filters that uh, bacteria or other organisms will not be able to filter through. They depend absolutely on the mechanism of their host for survival. And outside their hosts, they are referred to as inets. And then unlike other organisms, they possess either RNA or DNA. And in some situations, some viruses we have DNA and they have another stage where they have become RNA and vice versa. For example, the virus we are going to be talking about is an RNA virus, but it has an intermediate stage where it's uh, expressed as a DNA. And then not every virus will infect every cell. So we, there's what we call affinity for cells by each virus. For example, HIV has affinity for CD4 bearing cells and hepatitis B has affinity for hepatocytes of the liver. So for every virus, there's a specific cell that the virus will infect. AIDS is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Acquired, which means that the disease is not inherit, it's not a hereditary disease. You acquire it uh, by contact with somebody who is infected. Immunodeficiency, meaning that the virus will infect the immune system and weakens it. And then syndrome referred to a group of symptoms that indicates or are characterized a disease so there's no specific symptom that you say oh because you have this symptom you have AIDS no it's a group of symptoms and they vary depending on the individual depending on what the individual is exposed to and where that individual actually lives HIV is an acronym for human immunodeficiency virus it's a virus that will cause acquired immunodeficiency syndrome and it is a retrovirus has an RNA genome, as I mentioned earlier. Also has an enzyme referred to as a reverse transcriptase. The usual direction of flow of genetic material is from DNA to RNA and then to protein. But here we have a virus that is RNA and it uses this enzyme, the reverse transcriptase, to reverse transcribe the RNA to become a DNA so that it can get itself integrated into the host genome. And once that happens, it takes over the activity of the infected cell. So this enzyme is very key in the replication and the uh, transmission uh, of the virus. There's a difference between HIV and AIDS, a lot of people, when you say somebody is HIV infected, you just say, oh, the person has AIDS, but that's not correct because you could be HIV infected for a long time without any symptom, without any clinical presentation, and you live your life normally. So when you have, when you say AIDS is the late stage of the infection during which there's clinical disease. Why if somebody is HIV infected, yes, the person has it virus present in that person's uh, body but whether the person has AIDS or not will depend on the presence of clinical uh, disease so not everybody is infected with HIV has AIDS most HIV infected individuals will develop AIDS if they are not on antiretrovirus so AIDS is the end stage of HIV infection but it's well known now that with the presence or the availability of antiretroviral drugs, people with HIV can live for a long time and may even die without developing it. Die of other causes, of course. 
this is a diagram showing the structure of HIV. You can see how beautiful it looks. As beautiful as it is, it's also very dangerous. So you have uh, the main component of the virus, which is the the genome. It's an RNA genome. That's the viral RNA. You have the various enzymes, the reverse transcriptase, the integrase. It requires the integrase to get itself integrated into the host uh, genome. And then we have uh, the glycoproteins, GP120, GP41. These are the, the, the epitope of the virus that it uses to infect itself. They are usually referred to as uh, ligands. So it uses that the GP120 to attach itself to the CD4 uh, receptors of the cell and then get itself uh, integrated. So there are two types of HIV, type 1 and type 2. HIV is a highly variable virus and mutates very readily and easily. This means that as many different strains of HIV are available. So for somebody who is infected, for example, if you isolate a virus at a point of infection and come back in two, three months, isolate a virus, you are going to find some difference because for every round of replication of the virus, there's a level of a mutation that takes place and this accumulates over time but based on the genetic similarity and differences the virus has been classified into two you have hiv1 and hiv2 both types are transmitted through the same mode and they cause similar uh, uh, disease aids so you can't differentiate it by the disease that is caused but in their distribution, HIV-1 has been found everywhere in the world where it has been looked for. So HIV-1 is widely distributed. Or like HIV-2 that is limited to, to West uh, Africa. And those who have been found to have HIV-2 in different parts of the world have had one contact or the other with West Africa or with somebody who lives in West Africa. So HIV-2 is more of a West Africa uh, virus. We have here the a global map showing us the distribution of uh, HIV prevalence. You can see that the continent that is most hit is Africa, you know, and our beloved country is amongst those countries that are highly hit, that have a very high number of people living uh, with HIV and AIDS. And in US, Europe, and uh, Australia, you can see their rates are relatively lower compared to what we have uh, in Africa. For HIV-1 and HIV-2, there's difference in some area so the mode of transmission is the same likelihood of a uh, perinatal transmission that's from mother to child is higher with hiv1 than it is with hiv2 for hiv2 is just about one percent that's without a uh, antitroviral and for HIV-1, it's as high as 25 to 35% without antiretroviral. Then the likelihood of sexual transmission per exposure is also threefold higher with HIV-1. And the rate of developing AIDS is also higher with HIV-1. The rate of developing abnormal CD4 lymphocytes is also relatively higher with uh, HIV-1 and the distribution as said earlier HIV-1 is uh, widely world, worldwide while uh, HIV-2 is more or less limited uh, to West Africa. 
So for the different types, we have subtypes. That goes far to explain the heterogeneity of the virus. You know, it's a virus that changes on and on and on. And so for HIV-1, we have three major groups. That's the group M, the group O, the group N, and now actually four, group P. The interesting thing is that group O, group N, group P were first reported in Cameroon. And Cameroon is our neighbor, a country next to Nigeria. And the group, the M stands for major. So many of, well, most of the subtypes belong to the group M. So the M there stands for a major. The O stands for an outlayer because when that virus was uh, isolated for the first time, it was discovered that it's different from the M. So it was called an outlayer group, the O. And then the N came for either new or non-O, non-M. Discovered that it was different from M, it was different from O. So it was named non-N, non-O, non-M or a new group. And then, of course, the P just came and followed the alphabetical order. We had an M, we had an O, we had an N, so we just called that one a P. More than 90% of HIV infection belongs to the uh, group M. So within the group M, we also have at least nine genetically distinct subtypes you have subtype a and within a you have a1 a2 a3 and a4 there's subtype b there's subtype d subtype e there was an e before but it was now discovered that it's a recombinant so that's why e is missing in that list subtype f and you have f1 f2 there's g there's h there's j and there's K. So for HIV, it also has this unique property of uh, recombination. So if an individual is infected with one subtype, does not stop that individual from becoming infected with another subtype. So in a situation where you even have an individual being infected with one or more subtypes, different fragments of the virus can recombine to form something a mosaic virus and we refer to them as circulating recombinant forms for example the circulating recombinant form 2 that's the second type that was discovered the first type was the e i talked about it was initially known as e but it was later discovered after sequencing of the entire genome of the virus that contains some type some fragments of a and some fragments of E. So it was pulled out of that list and referred to as CRF01. Then the CRF02 was first isolated in Ibadan by Professor Olaleye, you know, and it has a mixture of subtype A and subtype G uh, genes. I will show us a picture of that in a, in a while. The AG recombinant is also known as IBNG. The IB stands for Ibadan and the NG stands for Nigeria, which has been shown to be the predominant, uh, predominant subtype or recombinant form in the entire uh, West and Central Africa. So this is what that uh, CRF02 CRF looks like you can see the fragments of the LTROs and the 5 prime and 3 prime and they are all uh, G when you see green is G if you see A red is A so you can see the part of the virus that belongs to subtype A and the part of the virus that belongs to subtype G so it's a combination of a uh, two different viruses there is also a more like a pattern of the distribution of the different uh, hiv subtypes 
in America and Western Europe, as well as Australia, we have the subtype B, the subtype C, and uh, B, C are also found in Asia. In Africa, that is the continent that is was hit by this uh, epidemic, has all the subtypes, especially in the West and Central Africa. The, you can see this is a graph that is showing isolates from Cameroon and Nigeria. In Cameroon, you can see the, pre, the predominant type there is the CRFO2. And then you have all the other CRFO6, CRFO9, CRFO11, subtype A. Same thing, look at Nigeria, with, as repeated by a report from Ibadan. You have CRFO2 also as a major, the G prime. There's G, there's CRFO6. So there's a combination of almost everything within the Central and Western Africa. This is also a global map that's showing you distribution of the different subtypes as mentioned earlier. If you look at uh, Europe, if you look at Northern America, you have one solid type, subtype B. Same in Australia. But you just look at Africa. You have everything. There's C, there's A, there's D, there's G, there's F, there's... You can see with the beautiful color of uh, Africa there. In HIV-2, we also have subtypes. Eight different subtypes have also been reported. Subtype A to H, you know, and group A spreads mainly in West Africa. And it's also found, it has also been reported in Angola, Mozambique, Brazil, India, and rarely in Europe, especially amongst those who have had one contact or the other with West Africa. Okay, this is a schematic drawing showing the classification of HIV type 1 and type 2. Within type, you now have within type 1, you have the group M, group O, group N, group P, and then within the group M, you have subtype A, B, C, D, F, G, H, K. And then you have 98. And this, I tell you, if I check the literature today, I'm sure I'll find more than 98. 98 circulating recombinant form. It tells you how heterogenic this virus can be. And this is a very great challenge, especially in the development of vaccine against the virus. Because we are going to develop a vaccine against A may not cover against B, C, D, E, and all of that, and even the recombinant forms. And then we see HIV type 2, there you have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. So infection of one type of virus or one subtype of the virus does not protect against infection with another type or subtype. So for an individual, you can have multiple infections which is actually a great challenge and results to this recombination that we are talking about. So new HIV genetic subtypes and CRS may be discovered in the future, you see? So if you are planning a vaccine for what is known today, tomorrow something new may come up. The yeah, vaccine will not even cover. So the current subtypes and CRS will also continue to spread to new areas as a uh, the epidemic continues. So how does HIV cause it? HIV infects and destroys the cells of the immune system known as the T helper cells. They're actually called T helper cells. Here is the structure of the immune system. You can see the T helper cells right at the center of the immune system. You know, it's the T helper cells that will identify a foreign body and send signal to all the other arms of the immune system so it's actually a, a helper because it helps the other arms of the immune system to perform their their responsibilities so this virus infects that particular cell and uh, destroys it 
and once that happens the virus then gets an upper hand over the individual and of course it's like you have uh, 20 or 100 soldiers defending a country by the time the enemies destroy uh, 20 of them you have 10 you have 10 people doing what 30 people are expected to do certainly it will not be done well so in that situation you start having what we call opportunistic infection infections that this immune system that is well uh, stable will be able to ad address or be able to destroy will now have you know get themselves integrated get themselves established and you still have this individual coming down with one issue uh, or the other so once the virus enters the cell replicates in it eventually to destroy the cell you know many particles of the virus are released and with time the cell gets uh, destroyed so as the virus destroys the cells initially the body will replace you know it's not as if the immune system is sleeping and just allowing the virus that's why you have a very long more or less uh, a, a asymptomatic phase because the immune system is also responding producing more of these cells so as initially you have what is called a, a steady state where the rate of destruction of the cells is is being taken care of by the rate at which the cells are being replaced in the system. However, as if more cells are infected, more viruses are released. So it gets to a point where uh, the rates of uh, release of virus and infection of the cell becomes higher than the rate at which the cells are being replaced. So at that point, you have this opportunistic infection that we've talked about the coming and the individual developed today is malaria like tomorrow is cough another day is tb another day is that and at that point you say this individual has developed it this is what we've talked about in a diagram on the early stage of the infection you can see at the initial stage the virus level goes very high and then at that point you see the cd4 which is the cells that are being infected they see drop you know the level of the cd4 reduces but because the system is replacing the cd4 goes up to another higher again as the virus load also drops and then you have a more or less relatively stable and a slight decline of the cd4 and at the point where you're having an exponential rise in the virus level you're also having an exponential decrease in the in the cd4 cell count so this would take like two three or even more years for some individuals to get to this stage where they will develop it so people who are not infected with hiv they have generally have good uh, the level of CD4 is between 700 and 1200 cells per microliter. Meanwhile, those who are infected, the CD4 can drop to as low as 50 or even less. We've had individuals who have less than 10 cells of CD4 cells per microliter in their blood. So in Nigeria, from a study that was done in Nigeria, in a healthy individual, the CD4 ranges from uh, 750 to about 3,000 cells per microliter. So opportunistic infections, these are infections that take advantage of the opportunity offered by the weakened immune system. Take note of these words, opportunistic it takes advantage of an opportunity and that opportunity has been offered by the immune system that the hiv has weakened so that's why you are called opportunistic infections so there are diseases that people with healthy immune system under normal circumstances 
will be able to to control it also takes a longer time for a person with hiv to recover from these diseases than it will take for somebody who has a very strong immune system like something like tb for somebody who has tb if you are hiv negative you will recover faster than somebody who is a hiv positive and has a tb so opportunistic infection may be caused by viruses may be caused by bacteria fungi or parasites you know this the list so for bacteria diseases such as tuberculosis mycobacterium avium complex bacteria pneumonia septicemia are very common protozoa diseases such as toxoplasma mycoporidiosis leishmaniasis are also known for fungal disease you have pneumocystic carina which is very common more in the western region than in africa but we've had some cases even in nigeria where you have hiv positive individuals presenting with pneumocystic carina pneumonia and virus diseases such as uh, cytomegalovirus, herpes virus, Zusta, and so on. For some of the symptoms of uh, clinical symptoms of AIDS, we include rapid weight loss, dry cough, recurring fever, profuse nice sweat, profound and unexplained fatigue. You are getting tired regularly, you know. We have in some case, cases we've had the uh, reports of memory loss or depression or other neurological disorders so each of these symptoms can be related to other illnesses so that's why you can't base oh, oh somebody is losing weight the person has hiv somebody has tb they also lose weight somebody who has a uh, diabetes can also lose weight so it's not unique None of this symptom is unique to HIV infection. And that's why we call it a syndrome. So diagnosis, you know, there's this uh, saying on, there used to be signboards all over the place. They say, AIDS not the show for face. The thing, the truth is when somebody has AIDS, you can even start suspecting. But when somebody is HIV, infected without it there's no way you will know you know the show it doesn't show on your face it doesn't show in your anything so the only way of knowing whether somebody is hiv infected is by going for a test period you must do a test to show that somebody is hiv infected so the presence of hiv in the body will cause the immune system to react and then it will produce a substance that is called antibodies and so these antibodies serve as a tool for diagnosing hiv infection because once you're hiv infected you remain hiv infected at least the information we have as of today once you have been infected you remain infected because the cell gets itself integrated into the host's a genome so it stays there and continues to to replicate so unlike some other infections where detecting antibodies may not confirm that the person is currently infected but for hiv we know once you are infected you remain infected until by the grace of god you'll be able to get a cure that can <laughs> clear the virus from the system that's from what science knows today once you're infected you're infected the body responds and produces antibody. So the routine diagnosis of uh, HIV is looking for these antibodies in the system. Looking for these antibodies in the system. So it's done in two stages. There's a screening and then a confirmation. The screening is looking 
the screening test looks for anything that is very close to HIV. So for a screening test, you stand a chance of having some level of false positive results. But this is such so that you don't miss it out. Especially when the screening is done towards blood transmission. You don't want to make a mistake. So for screening tests, it's sensitivity is very, very high. Highly sensitive. Such that you have more of uh, so that you don't miss any positive. Even if it means picking a few truly negatives. So for this screening test, we have those at the ELISA. That will take some two, three hours to accomplish. You have the rapid assays. That will take uh, 10 to 30 minutes to complete. And then you have assays that can use blood. So assays that can use saliva or use urine. And of course, the best result is gotten when blood samples are used. And then we have the confirmation test. When you do a screening test and it turns out positive, we actually don't say positive because of the possibility of false negative so we say reactive yes there's something in this blood that is reacting with the assay so we need to go ahead to confirm it so you do a confirmatory test in your confirmatory test which most of the time is western blood is able to detect specific antigens of the virus and at the end of your confirmatory test you can actually say okay it was positive, negative, or indeterminate. So your confirmatory test must also have a very high specificity. So for screening, the sensitivity must be very high, and confirmation, your specificity must be high. So at the end of a confirmation, you say it's positive, it's negative, or indeterminate. Indeterminate in the sense that oh there's something in this sample but it does not meet the criteria for positivity so on the epidemiology of the virus as at the uh, end of 2019 we have about 38 million people globally who are living with hiv or aids and of course AIDS has killed over 30 million people since uh, the beginning of the epidemic and we have an estimated 690,000 million sorry not million 690,000 people that's a mistake who died of AIDS uh, related diseases in the year 2020 and and it is known to be responsible for about one in every five deaths in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. About two-thirds of the people living with HIV are found in Africa. So imagine that a continent that is highly hit. New infection in 2020, about 1.7 million people globally are known to become newly infected. However, there was a reduction in the rate of uh, new infection in South Africa and East Africa by 38%. Meanwhile, in some other parts of the world, Europe and Asia, there was an increase by about 72%. In fact, that is a lot. As well as the Middle East and Latin America with a 21 to 22% rate of increment. Barrier to control of uh, the epidemic stigma and discrimination has been shown to be a very key barrier in controlling the spread of the virus how does that happen because of stigma one people don't want to go for a test they say oh it's better for me to die what i don't know than to go and find out that i'm hiv positive and everybody will run away from me so that's one way or when they know their status they hide it or they go underground and then they spread it. So stigma and discrimination is a major barrier in the control of uh, HIV infection. Another barrier is access to ART. You know, from the UN report, 
out of the 38 million who are living with HIV AIDS, about 12 point something million are not on ART. ART stands for anti-retroviral anti treatments. And these drugs are known to reduce the virus load. And when the virus load is reduced, the rate of transmission is also reduced. So that's why there's need for almost everybody who is infected to be on the third. There's a public health benefit of the antiviral apart from that individual benefiting from the fact that the antiviral helps to reduce the virus load and allows that person to go about his or her activities normally. It also has a public health importance in that the transmission of the virus is also reduced. And so we have less number of uh, new cases. The another factor that has also been shown to also influence is the gender, gender based vi uh, violence, especially the rape of uh, the female gender. And uh, it's been reported that many of uh, those who are raped end up becoming HIV infected. Also, if you look at the characteristics of the rapists, there are a lot of time people on drug and all of that and we know the relationship between hiv and drug use you know hiv infection usually very high among individuals who are using uh, hard drugs we just look at briefly the situation of hiv in nigeria nigeria is the third largest country with the highest number of uh, infection i think we're in number two now next to india and then south africa and the virus is very the spread of very very complex in that different parts of the country have different rates we are going to see that in a while when we look at the map of nigeria showing the distribution of hiv in uh, in nigeria Usually, the prevalence in the country is determined by looking at the general population and through a national HIV sentinel survey that looks at pregnant women. Pregnant women are chosen for that survey because one, you must have sex to become pregnant. So that's one of the reasons why pregnant women are used. And secondly, pregnant women will have visit the hospital where they can be accessed and they will do many more other tests along during the course of their pregnancy so that's why they they they, they, they are more or less a convenient uh, group of uh, individuals to use for that survey but in the recent survey that was done in nigeria it was done on a household base they move from house to house and access uh, individuals in houses that have been already pre-marked to be in that survey so in some states the epidemic is more concentrated while in other states you have more generalized epidemic some states you may have some particular area that are referred to as hot spots you know where you, the infection is actually high and then relatively lower in other parts of the state. The reason for the difference in the rate of infection is not very clear. And some researchers have actually attributed it to differences in the sexual behavior of the people living in these different parts of uh, the country. So we have here the map of Nigeria showing the different uh, geographical zones of the country and the prevalence of uh, HIV infection. Sorry, that information about the, it's not 2010, it's 2018. So we can see it's highest in uh, the South-South. Then you have the North Central, and then we have the Southeast southwest northeast and then uh, the north uh, west so in nigeria the very first case of hiv it was reported in 1986 and then the prevalence of the virus increased from 1.8 in 
1991 when the first sentinel was conducted to 5.8 in 2001 and then it dropped to 5.0 in 23. In 2010, the survey showed that the rate had dropped to 4.0. Then in 2018, a Nigerian HIV AIDS indicator and impact survey, NICE household survey, was carried out in all the states of the federation a hundred and one thousand two hundred and sixty seven households were enrolled and in adults belonging in the age group 15 to 64 years and you can find a detail of that survey in the link that has been provided so this report shows that HIV prevalence in the adult population 15 to 64 is 1.4%. It was lower among men than women, that's 1% versus 1.8%. Lower in the urban, urban and rural than rural. For, for, for the, the gender difference, I want to say here that at the beginning of the epidemic, the rate was almost one on one to one for male to female. But now we can see that we have more women than men who are uh, infected. Of course, there are some reasons can be attributed to that. You know, the is issue of polygamy, for instance, you have one man with many wives. So if the man is infected, there's a chance of infecting more than one woman. Then we also have the the surface area of of the woman that is exposed as a vagina the surface area is white the sperm when deposited stays there for a long time and we know that sperms also be are hiv infected for somebody is infected so there's a longer time for this virus to go in and infect the woman unlike the man where the area that is exposed is just at the tip of the penis which you know the chance of the virus getting in is lower compared to the the woman where you have a very wide low large surface area and then it is also was also lower in the urban than rural is also a difference at the early part of the epidemic the rate was higher in the urban and now we are saying it's higher in the rural you know this is also a cause for concern and some of the reasons that may be attributed is even the the, the availability of uh, arts you know the urban communities have better access than you have in the rural community and then you have infected individual moving to the rural communities and having all sorts and all of that so these are some of the challenges it was also highest in Aqua Ibom, 44.8 percent, Benue, 4.3, and River State, 3.6 percent, and the lowest rate was found in Jigawa, at 0.3 percent. That survey also showed that the rate was higher or highest among the divorced and the widowed than it was among the married. the trend of hiv infection we can see over the years the first survey was done in 1991 you can see an increase from 91 up to 2001 and then we begin to see a drop from 2003 2005 in 2008 there was a slight increase and then 2010 and then the second graph is showing us what has happened between 2012 and 2015 we can see a consistent drop in the rates of uh, hiv infection in the country and the latest which is a nice survey says 1.4 but it will be difficult to compare that with this because this is looking at a different population it's using the pregnant women to to stand in for the general population unlike the other survey that went house to house.
So the main HIV mode of transmission in Nigeria is heterosexual sex, that's about 90 to 95 percent. I will not say that for heterosexual anymore. I will use that to say sexual because we know that there's a relatively high level of men, men having sex with men in going on within the country. So instead of heterosexual, I'll rather say sexual modes of transmission it will be 90 to 95 percent. And then sex followed by blood transfusion and then uh, you have mother to child uh, transmission without the use of uh, antitroviral it's known that about 30 to 45 percent of mothers will transmit to their children but with the use of antitroviral this rate has dropped to less than one percent so antitroviral has actually come to change the face of hiv infection not only in nigeria but globally so injection drug use and homosexual sex are accounting for an increasing number of new hiv infection hence their role in the spread of infection is becoming very very important a study that was done in lagos showed about 45 percent among uh, rates of hiv infection among men having sex uh, with men so this is a group targeting so at the beginning we had about one to one the ratio of male to female and then recent times stilting towards women as we've discussed and then the youth and young adults in nigeria are particularly vulnerable for hiv and most of you listening to this lecture belong to this age group 15 to 24 so that is one of the reason of bringing in this uh, GS102 so that early enough you'll be able to get information and you'll be able to prepare yourself for ensuring that you remain HIV negative and also get information that you can use to educate your peers, your community your friends to make sure that we all contribute our quota in controlling the spread of hiv infection yeah this is you can see from the trend you can see the 15 to 19 over the years you can see the rate of infection among the different age groups so in nigeria we've had the current support for HIV, the truth is, government is supporting very minimally towards the control of uh, this epidemic in Nigeria. Most of the support are coming from outside, from the US government through a fund that is called the President's Emergency Plan for its relief, PEPFA. It's available to, uh, I think, 20 countries or thereabouts, funded by the US government. And there's a global fund. The global fund, you have every country, you know, adding money into that post. And then, depending on the need of a country, they are being supported towards the control of the virus in terms of testing in terms of provision of drugs in terms of uh, enlightenment providing information to the community education and all of that then we also have world bank that supports uh, some of these activities and of course the federal government of nigeria but as i said earlier most of the support comes from these outside bodies okay i think i'm done and thank you for being part of the class i hope we are able to achieve our objective okay if you have any question 
what link do you even send it to? Mm. I think on the LMS platform, you can actually post questions if you have any, and then it will be taken care of. And there's supposed to also be linked to tutors who should be able to address uh, some of or all of your questions. So if you have access to your tutors, uh, email or whatsapp you must have a whatsapp group you can post your questions there and uh, it will be addressed once again thank you for listening bye